Hi, Bill. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I, I missed you terribly uh, over the Thanksgiving holiday. Yes, we, we took the week off. Uh, this week in blog did not come in uh, last week. So we are, we are back taping uh, the week after Thanksgiving. And uh, again, I'm Con Carroll, the uh, official blogger of the Heritage Foundation. I'm Bill Scher, blogger for Campaign for America's Future and Liberal Oasis. You also blog at The Next Right, I believe. I do, I do. I'm not an editor there, though. I mean, they, you know, the Soren and Patrick and uh, Hinky and, and Matt Moon, they, they can uh, post stuff on the front page there if they want. But uh, I have to write what I want and then, and then sell it to them to get it promoted, to, to, uh, to get it up there. So uh, I contribute, but, uh, you know, it's, it's not my baby. So, uh, big excitement for uh, bloggers in the conservative blogosphere, uh, a victory in Georgia. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I don't know if it's, if it's super excitement, but... Uh, Red State was excited. Uh, Eric was excited. Eric was excited. But it's a bit more of a home state win for him. He's, uh, he's uh, down there and making himself, so... Uh, a favorite headline, blog headline on the left was from Fire Dog Lake's Blue Texan. Uh, Eric Erickson dances in end zone after a late field goal by Saxby Chambliss makes final score 48-3. to Yes, yes. Uh, I, I always like Fire Dog Lake for their uh, good headlines and humor. Uh, so, so what is the general attitude? I mean, is it, uh, a, is it a sense of saving grace or is it a shrug of the shoulders that, well, this was expected in the first place? Um, no, I think there is more of a, um, you know, I, well, Sean Oxendine at, at The Next Right, which you mentioned, had had a good post, which kind of kind of summed up my feelings. He had he had four main points. Um, first of all, he said uh, this election is only a data point, but it is a useful data point. Uh, Chambliss actually received about two hundred thousand more votes than he received in two thousand two midterm election, while Martin received about as many votes as Cleveland did that year. Uh, in other words, I'm more comfortable with using this election as a data point than I am with using most other special elections. Uh, second. Uh, second point was the Save the Filibuster is a useful slogan for 2010. Um, he notes that uh, polling data show that a good chunk of Martin's voters were concerned enough about the prospect of a filibuster-proof Democratic majority to call into question whether they would vote for him. Uh, three was that uh, Obama had coattails, which uh, should make the Democrats nervous about 2010 when he's not going to be on top of the ticket. And, uh, the, and the fourth point is that the real test is Saturday. Uh, there's another runoff, um, our special election, Republican versus Democrat, in the 4th condistri- uh, Congressional District of Louisiana. And uh, Sean writes, Democrats, after all, were winning open seats in the South with regularity before 2006-2008. But if Republicans win Louisiana District by more than a couple of points, combined with the Chambliss result, we will begin to have some good evidence that the anti-Republican backlash of the, of the last few years has really begun to subside. Um, so, yeah, I think... You know that pretty much sums it up. It's it's a data point. It's not something to get overly excited about, but I think it might sh- uh, show a, a turning of the tide. That uh, you know, with with Bush Bush's name coming off the top of the ticket, you know, it's like a huge huge anchor has been lifted around Republicans' necks. Um, so things are looking up. Um, well, both uh, Nate Silver at five thirty eight and Chris Bowers at Open Left uh, also took a, a note of caution. From that, and I think um, uh, Bauer's point uh, has a lot of merit. Uh, last night's results at a different Democracy Corps poll, which talked about um, slight pluralities, nervous that uh, Congress would be too much of a rubber stamp to Obama, um, so the country isn't going to dump on Republicans forever. There's no grace period when the country will still vote for Democrats just because they hate Republicans. Democrat hopes in 2010, 2012 rest entirely on our governing record during the next two to four years. Uh, and I think that's that's largely right. Uh, How can it not be? Well, right. I mean, it's, it's, it's somewhat of a, of a basic. But, I mean, you could, I mean, it, there's a, a chance, you know, over time, if uh, Democrats establish a certain amount of credibility and Republic credi- Republican credibility was shot, then you could stand to have some imperfect years and not, you know, lose, you know, all of Washington. Uh, but this is too, it, it's too early for that. Uh, but I'd also recall, I believe Reagan lost seats in Con- Republicans lost seats in Congress in eight, 1982. Right, coming off a recession. There was, a, there was a recession then. Right. But over the four-year period, Reagan's record was seen as better than his predecessor's, Jimmy Carter's, and he won in a landslide. So, um, even though there's going to be a, a certain difficulty in showing 
on a tangible economic improvement over a short window of time because the hole is so deep. Um, it's a possibility that if things are going to pan out better in four years than two, um, uh, losing in 2010 is not going to be losing in 2012. Now, I'm, I'm not even that pessimistic about 2010, um, but it's always difficult to extrapolate too much out of one election. Right, right. But, you know, I think I, 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 what I saw in both Nate's and Chris' posts were, was the acknowledgement that, you know, the, the toxicity of the Republican brand is, with Bush leaving, is, is rapidly wearing off. And that, uh, you know, as great as Obama did, there hasn't been a ton of correlation um, or uh, melding of the Obama and Democratic brand. And then what we saw in, in, in 2008 was really an, an Obama victory, uh, whatever that means, um, and not a, a hard left Democrat victory. Well, that's a lot of extrapolating on your part, I might argue. <laughs> um, we don't have to go too deep into that. Well, uh, well, well, let's look at the Democracy Course poll, which is, of course, run by two Democratic pollsters, mm -hmm. the, one, the one that Chris cites. Right. And, and, you know, the two questions are, you know, what are you, what are you more concerned with? Uh, that Congress will prevent Barack Obama from making the kinds of changes that are needed, or that Democratic Congress will become too much of a rubber stamp. And the, the people that were worried about the Democrats becoming a rubber stamp with 49 percent. And then when you slightly uh, changed the question and, and made it, I'm more concerned that Republicans in Congress will obstruct Barack Obama's agenda versus I'm more concerned that Democrats in Congress will be too much of a rubber stamp. It's pretty much the same result, 43-48. So, you know, it definitely shows that there is a lot of that – as bad as the, the, the Republican brand is under Bush, the American public has not wholeheartedly uh, embraced the Democratic brand. Well, I mean, I, I, I think that latter part you say is true. They're, Democrats have been given a chance. Um, but I think it's a different thing than saying that the toxicity of the Republican brand has already dissipated just because a victory would happen in Georgia, number one. And number two, that Democracy Corps question – doesn't talk at all about specific policy ideas and where the public stands at that from an ideological perspective. You have a USA Today Gallup poll. I mean, the first thing out of the box is going to be a major uh, econo economic recovery plan package, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a second, um, that by any, by any, any definition would be a, a progressive left-of-center package. We're talking about a significant amount of, of government investment. Uh, we don't know what the number is going to be yet, but the parameters of the discourse are talking about between, you know, big and really big. Right. Um, and uh, USA Today Gallup poll this week, you know, said, do you think we need to have, uh, you know, a big government stimulus plan? And that won 58 to 33. So uh, the point of the democracy group poll is, I think, is, is, is a general skepticism of consolidation of too much power into one person. Um, a general fear that uh, things might be taken too far. There's not, again, a deep reservoir of trust. Uh, just, you know, the guy's even president yet. But he's still uh, achieving, you know, pretty stratospheric approval numbers during the transition and, and pretty widespread support for his main policy plank on day one. Uh, not a bad place to start and certainly not any kind of uh, – deep reservation about the general ideological direction he's going in. Um, yeah, that's true to a certain extent. I, I just want to go quickly back to Georgia Senate to, to uh, go back to uh, another Matt Stoller post. Um, uh, he wrote, uh, I'll note that there is an increasing likelihood that the Republicans are going to shed some of their big business allegiances and retreat into a much more nativist mode. I know this sound, sounds crazy, but hear me out. First of all, Saxby Chambliss gave Sarah Palin credit for his victory last night. Uh, Palin uses the term good union job to describe her husband's works, her husband's work, and generally operates as a reactionary populist. Uh, he goes on, foundations are devastated because of endowment losses leading to nonprofit cutbacks, corporations are cutting back on lobbying, and advertising sales that sustain mainstream conservative media are crashing. The right wing infrastructure is probably going to face some serious cutbacks as rich people and companies find their wealth evaporating. In other words, it's going to become cheaper to organize people than money, which will help populists across the board. That means Republicans might morph into a fully nativist populist party during a prolonged economic slump, and big business will invest relatively more in the Democratic Party. 
Um, Do you think that's an accurate assessment of the conservative movement? There is a lot there I think is accurate, and there's a lot there I think is 100% wrong. Um, the the accurate part is that the, the Republicans are going to get more populist, and they are going to shed uh, some big business allegiances, but not in the way that Matt sees it. Um, I think, you know, you're, you, you see Sarah talking about good union jobs, and it's good that she does that. You know, r- you know Reagan always said, you know, I, w- I was a union member. But at the same time, but you, but, but you don't like unions. Uh, I don't like I don't like union leadership. I don't like union leadership that that forces um, members' dues uh, from workers and spends hundreds of million dollars uh, trying to elect Democrats um, or you know unions but that you, you you like the basic principle that workers should be allowed to organize and collectively bargain for for good wages and benefits. Uh, if they had the option of also not joining the union, I would I would support that idea. Unfortunately, that that's not the legal regime we exist under. Um, but going on, I don't think you're going to see. Um, I, I think what what Sarah's rhetoric shows is the same kind of um, better rhetoric that Reagan had of saying, you know, uh, union workers are good, union workers are strong. We're not against uh, union workers. We're against union leadership. Um, so, so you are going to see uh, a softening of that tone, but you're not going to see any type of movement towards going towards more restrictionist policies, uh, etc. Um, but I do think you are going to see a more libertarian populism. Uh, you know, look at the, the broad success of, of the Ron Paul campaign. Um, you know, Ron Paul's not exactly a charismatic guy. It's not like that movement took off because Ron Paul gives great speeches. Uh, Soren Dayton, who, who writes over the next right, said, you know, one of the big Travesty's looking back on the GOP campaign in 2008 was the way um, the party itself treated the Ron Paul voters and that there was, you know, a legitimate, organic, uh, libertarian populist uh, movement that had money, uh, had a message, had strength, and instead of working with it and adopting some of those ideas and bringing it into the tent, it was, uh, you know, the Republican establishment tried to just, you know, strangle it in the grave. So I do think you are going to see a shift away from kind of big business and more to a libertarian populism. Um, so, you know, not, not necessarily the direction that, that Matt would have it going. The second point where I just think he's he's dead wrong is, uh, number one, that corporations are cutting back on lobbying. <laughs> That's just not true. <laughs> if you look at any of the reporting coming out of the Hill, the New York Times, Roll Call, uh, businesses knowing that the Democrats are coming into power, uh, Democrats, you know, exist to control the economy and, uh funding as much power as I can through Washington. And, of course... Do you know what he was citing? Who was citing? What, what Stoller was citing? He didn't have he a link that? there. He didn't have any link there. Oh, that's just, that's just uh, chatter that's, just heard. That, I get, that's just chatter. Uh, but everything I've been reading is that uh, actually corporations have been pouring more money into lobbying. Now, of course, they're spending a lot more of it on uh, Democrats. I hear Democrats on the Hill are, you know, fetching around $200,000, $250,000 as a starting salary at, at lobbying firms. Um, but, yeah, there's a mad scramble on corporate America to pour money into K Street because, you know, you talked about that. I don't think you put a number on it, but I've heard anywhere from $500 billion to $1 trillion. Um, corporations are going to want a slice of that, and they're going to be willing to plunk down some money to, uh, to get as much of it as possible. Um, well, you're interesting to see how successful they are. Oh, I th- they'll be plenty successful. Did, well, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that's uh, true. Yeah, they're already, we'll, we'll, they're we'll already getting tons enough. of bailout money. Um, but, yeah, I, th- I mean, the rest of it, you know, foundations are devastated because of endowment losses. I'm sure that's true, but I'm not hearing – I mean, he says there, there are nonprofit cutbacks. I haven't heard of any. Um, right-wing infrastructure is probably going to face serious cutbacks. Uh, or, and, uh, the, uh, I believe the National Association of Manufacturers is, is experiencing cutbacks. It's true, uh, but that would be more of the corporations, not of that. Uh, they're they're an industry. They're, they're, they're industry they're a lobbying. They're actually. an industry nonprofit. I mean, they're an industry trade group, not a foundation the nonprofit function, like he was talking about. That functions very much as a right. lobby. Yeah. And then he also says advertising sales that sustain me- mainstream conservative media are crashing. Uh, that actually is true, but I don't think that's just true for mainstream conservative media. I think uh, advertising revenue for pretty much everyone is crashing. So, uh, you know, you are going to see a lot more uh, grassroots um, organizing going along. I just don't think it's going to be in quite the direction that, that Matt says it's going to be in. Well, it'll be interesting if... if uh uh, the libertarian populist tone is what uh, dominates uh, when you know, we're going to, in all likelihood, have a pretty significant uh, government investment, public investment package uh, defining the course of the next t- two years at least. Um, and, of course, as we mentioned earlier, whether that works or not 
is going to be uh, a pretty uh, dominating factor in what happens electorally. Uh, if uh, conservatives bet on uh, anti-government libertarianism and the increased uh, public investment is perceived to be working, uh, that could put conservatives out on the fringes for a very long time. Yeah, well, you know, that's the big ideological bet we're going to see here. Um, so but, ha- there's been a number Go of... Go for it. I'm sorry, well, I mean, there's been a number of posts uh, lately on the left trying to, you know, uh, get our arms around uh, what this package should look like. Uh, you know, there's one, there's a debate over uh, how big and there's a debate over what should be in it. Uh, my own boss at Campaign for America's Future, uh, Bob Borisad, she had a post up at Huffington Post as well as uh, our site, ourfuture.org, where he talks about Obama's chief economic advisor, uh, uh, Larry Summers, who suggests quite a speedy, substantial, and sustained fiscal stimulus at levels of $350 billion a year or more. Uh, a key question is whether the stimulus will be strategic, investing in areas vital to our future rather than simple one-off expenditures for temporary effect. Uh, Matt Iglesias uh, talks about this as well. Uh, this is one reason why I think it's important for a stimulus package to have a heavy element of aid to state and local government and related agencies. The federal government contains a lot of automatic stabilizers. Uh, spending keeps going even the revenues fall. That should act as stimulus, but those stabilizers are offset by the pro-cyclical nature of the state and state and local budget practices. Federal promise of aid will forestall state and local budget cuts, thus allow automatic stabilizers to work. Uh, all that can be mobilized on a rapid time scale. Somewhat similarly, the federal government can pledge funds to transit agencies in order to finance fare cuts rather than contra- uh, contractionary combination of fare acts and service cuts that we're currently look- looking at. Add a few tens of billions of dollars worth of shovel-ready infrastructure projects you might be getting somewhere. Um, you know, uh, Sterling Newbury at Fire Dog Lake, uh, in referring uh, to the news that we've already been in a recession for a full year, talks about what a disaster it shows that last year's stimulus was, which was essentially rebate checks. So that helps bolster the argument for uh, public investment in tangible things, um, as well as state and local government aid so they can uh, keep providing services. Uh, that's the direction we seem to be going in. Um, and the question becomes uh, uh, exactly what those projects are, making sure they're being decided on a, on a, on a meritorious basis, not on a lobbyist-driven, uh, earmarked pork barrel basis. In fact, there was a Heritage Post I saw saying no earmarks in the stimulus package, and that's something I would fully – I think it was the first Heritage Post I ever agreed with um, – because uh, if this needs to, for it to work, it needs to be done uh, in a merit-based way, and, and and less so in a political way. Yeah. Um, so you know, I, I guess I don't I don't hear a lot of coherence there. I mean, on the one hand, you're saying we need to get this money out the door as fast as possible, but on the other hand, you're saying we need to build this magical box that's going to make sure all the money is invested wisely and not based on uh, lobbying or political other political ideas. Um, you know, so well, I, 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 I guess I guess my question is, is uh, you know, what what is there a coherent plan uh, that's being pushed in order to make sure that happens? I I can only presume that's what the transition team is working on right now. Um, you know, we haven't been privy to the specifics yet. They've only outlined uh, basic principles. You know, we had a story in the New York Times today about. Uh, the green stimulus component of it. Uh, I, I know you love the green collar jobs. It's your favorite topic. Uh, well, it's, it's, now, it's now annoying me a lot less that it's all going to be wrapped into the stimulus. So, you know, it's all just it's, it's diluted. It, now it's all just big government New Deal spending, and you know, if you call some of a green, fine, whatever. I guess the rest of it's brown or orange or whatever. I don't. Yeah, it, it bothers me less. <laughs> Um, interestingly, and they talked about that, you know, I talked about a number of things, but they mentioned weatherization projects, and that's, I thought that, that caught my eye because that's something you can do immediately. You know, some of these things are long-term projects, uh, and we're talking about a recession that could last until 2010. That's why you see Borisaj talking about not just substantial but sustained. Uh, these are not something to just prevent a, you know, two-quarter recession. We're talking about potential well, but are recession. Are weatherizing right? buildings, or is, that, is that a sustained, is that considered sustained No, that's, that's, that's something that would be more short-term. Okay. You, you, you could weatherize things now. So wait, are you, are you uh, for or against so that's weatherizing? Some, I'm You're sorry? You're for or against weatherizing? I'm for it. I'm, I'm saying that it's interesting that there's going to be a combination here of things that I suspect you will see the impact of immediately. It's not like weatherization is not something that requires 
you know, more technology or R&D, just a question of, you know, like I've mentioned before, my own home, my state of Massachusetts subsidized my weatherization 50%. So, um, so basically you're, you're for everything. You're for both sustained uh, well, exactly. s- spending that's going to be sustained and, and renewable, but also stuff that's going to be short-term like weatherizing, um, just as long as all it's done wisely. Well, exactly. Okay. And so that to speak to what, you know, Bowers was talking about before. If you can do stuff that's going to be felt in a positive way immediately, that's going to help you politically in 2010. Uh, and maintain support for a longer-term strategy. Um, and if that stuff is working well uh, and the right is planting its flag on libertarian populism, you know, that's going to put them out in the cold. If this stuff is not executed well and you get more of like a, you know, a big dig situation where there's a lot of cost overruns and uh, safety problems and things like that, then it's going to blow up in everybody's face. Yeah, that's, so this is very, I mean, this is very high stakes. Right. No, I mean, you, you talk about the big dig, and, of course, they just opened the Capitol's Visitor Center, which, you know, initially was only going to cost $90 million, ended up costing $630 million, and, you know, it took forever to build. Um, and I guess, you know, if, you're, if the Democratic Party's future rests on whether or not all this infrastructure spending is going to come on uh, on time, uh, not overly budgeted, and be free of political scandal, uh, I'm willing to take that bet. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and uh, read it. Uh, Greg uh, Mankiw post, which is which is on point. Um, yeah. He says one thing: all economists agree on. If there are public investment projects that pay a high rate of return, those are worth paying for, even if it means borrowing. But that is always true. Even if we were at full employment and there were no possible employment effects or fiscal stimulus, yeah. we should undertake public investments that pass a cost-benefit test. In this regard, two observations come to mind. First, since most infrastructure is used locally, the proper level of spending is best determined by state and local governments rather, rather than by the federal government. And Heritage has done a lot of work on how states can best reform their own uh, procurement systems to make sure that they're making uh, transportation infrastructure uh, done wisely. Uh, second, Mankey writes, more public projects would pass a cost-benefit test if we replace the Davis-Bacon Act. This law requires contractors on these public projects to pay prevailing wages, which are typically union wages well in excess of what could occur in a free market. If the government paid market determined wages for infrastructure projects, we could have both more infrastructure and less government debt. Without debt, the legacy would benefit future generations. Well, interesting. I I wasn't prepared to talk about this, but uh, Ryan Avent, who blogs at the Bellows, uh, I think is the same post you're talking about. the, the yes. point about state of, uh, state and local governments being better for public investment than federal? Yes, that's, that's been a long heritage uh, position. Yeah. Uh, right, Advent says, this seems like the kind of thing Greg Mankey might want to justify rather than simply assert. I can think of about ten different ways as in stand up to scrutiny. First and most obviously, quality interstate transportation is economically important. Absent federal coordination of infrastructure spending, we would probably see suboptimal investment in such transport. It doesn't do a state much good to build a high-speed rail line or new freight capacity up to its border and no further. Um, He goes on for a little bit more. So I think I'm sure there are certain examples where that's true, but there are certain things that you need to have uh, federal support, coordination, high-speed rail being one, uh, smart electrical. Yeah, but so much much of the uh, infrastructure as as far as – yeah. Uh, bridges, roads, well, um, I mean, especially the stuff you're talking about, light rail, um, that's all going to be within cities, which, you know, except for well, which, ex- which except I, for D.C., I, which you I have here, are generally, you know, within a state. And I don't get the impression from what Obama was saying, for example, at the uh, uh, Governors Association meeting this week that he's looking to micromanage stuff like that. He's, he, he's looking to the governor specifically and saying, you know, you have a better sense of what projects are, are shovel-ready, and are needed to uh, help your state, and I'm looking to you to help design those plans. So uh, he's looking for those state partnerships and, and, help, and, and looking to help help subsidize them but not have it be uh, overly micromanaged. Um, yeah, well, we'll see what the what Nancy puts on his desk on uh, January 20th. We will see. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, one other post, um, this one by uh, Matthew Continetti, who, who was on Blogging Heads earlier this week. But uh, he was he was um, taking on a Paul Krugman column. Um, uh, Krugman was citing two uh, two ideas about yeah. or when there was a liquidity um, liquidity trap in the past. And uh, Matthew Block quotes Krugman: um, "The first took place in 1937 when Franklin Roosevelt mistakenly heeded the advice of his own era's deficit wor- era's deficit warriors. He sharply re- reduced government spending, among other things, cutting the Works Progress Administration in half. Are we, do, are we doing New Deal stuff? 
Yeah, just this one post. Oh, do we are, are we still on this? Are you still trying he, to pretend the New Deal didn't work? Uh, you're cutting me off. Here. This this is this is Krugman admitting the New Deal didn't work and explaining why. Well, Kr- Krugman's argument was the New Deal wasn't progressive enough. Right. Will, will you just at least let me finish the post? <laughs> okay. okay. He sharply reduced government spending. This is Krugman's words still. He sharply reduced government spending, among other things, cutting the worst progress administration in half, and also, and then this is what Continental bolds out of Krugman, raise taxes. The result was a severe recession and a steep fall in private investment. Still Krugman. The second episode took place 60 years later in Japan. In, 19, in 1996, 1997, the Japanese government tried to balance its budget, cutting spending, and again, Continental bolds this part, raising taxes. And again, the recession that followed led to a steep fall in private investment. Matthew then comments, so in both cases, the government cut spending and prolonged recession. But that's not all. In both cases, the government also raised taxes and prolonged recession. Funny, Krugman doesn't focus much, uh, doesn't focus much or at all on this part of the evidence. And uh, Matt, con- Matt concludes, the chances that the, book's ta- the Bush tax cuts remain in place after 2010 just got a little bit higher, which uh, I thought was noteworthy since we, we, ref- we have a fill, fulfill, uh, heard official word from the Obama administration that uh, if, the, if there are going to be raises on taxes, it's not going to come until 2010 when the Bush tax cuts expire. So he's Probably. already already pulled back on the uh, on, on the raising on those fairly, raising taxes. Fairly fairly minor pullback. It's not something that really undermines the overall direction he campaigned on and still plans to go in. It's it's a it's it's, a question it's, of it's hundreds of billions of dollars of minorness. Whether it's done in oh nine or oh eleven, I mean, it's not dramatically different. It's a question of what's the best time to execute that one component of the policy. Um. Okay, it's still hundreds of billions of dollars of, of, of minorness. Uh, so we, I guess we'll just disagree on what the definition of minor is. I, I think what year that has done in is a minor point. Uh, I mean, I mean, potentially maybe important as far as getting out of the recession is concerned, but not, I, I don't think it's an example of reversal of policy or breaking of promises. That is way overstating what Oh, what no, year no, that is I just think it's, it's a great acknowledgement that we don't want to be raising taxes. Uh, you know, on the brink and or of during a recession. Well, it's a it's it's a fairly Keynesian point that uh, in times of recession, you want to uh, cut taxes and raise spending, uh, and 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 put deficit concerns aside, uh, which is very different than the conservative argument, which is regardless of economic condition, we can always justify a reason for tax cuts on the wealthy. Uh, well, we like tax cuts for everyone, specifically well, capital gain tax cuts. Of course. But, um, as long as they're proportionally more for the wealthy. While we're still on the economy, did you want to uh, – you had some posts on the auto bailout you want to talk about. Well, auto bailout is, is, is hot, um, complicated, maddening, um, but uh, pretty serious stuff. Uh, and uh, I, I have to say, I haven't I, – I, I would argue – uh, in general, that this is probably an issue that cuts across ideological lines. I don't think it is a unanimous uh, liberal opinion to be for the bailout. Uh, <clears throat> there's certainly plenty of liberals that uh, are none too happy with the, the big three. These are folks that fought, you know, green uh, rules uh, and did not invest in electric cars. Yeah. You know, GM killed the electric car at one point. Um, not all that keen about uh, putting uh, government money behind them, but. There's a, there's a different argument, of course, from the left that uh, there's there's a million plus jobs at stake here. Uh, certainly not the right time to see such a massive collapse of the manufacturing industry. Good union jobs that are at stake, uh, and we need uh, these factories to yeah, build these electric cars, and that could be part of a deal of any kind of bailout. And as far as the the blogging I've seen, I've I've, I've generally only seen more uh, pro uh, rescue posts. I haven't seen as many anti. On the left. So what I what I have seen, um, Marcy Wheeler at Empty Wheel. She's been on top of this uh, for a long time. Uh, she had one post in particular that talked about the importance of dealerships and all this. She doesn't refer to them as the big three. She calls them the big two and a half because uh, GM and Chrysler are effectively being one and a half. Uh, the big two and a half bailout will help in one way because it'll get credit flowing again to dealers and to consumers. But consumer spending, especially on big-ticket items like cars, is down significantly. Until people are buying cars again in in big numbers again, dealers are going to continue to go under. I'll be curious this week whether a couple weeks back home of watching dealerships struggle will help convince Congress that this crunch will affect more than just Michigan and Ohio, because in many respects it's been a regional 
breakdown in Congress where um, GM, Ford, and Chrysler factories are. Uh, Jonathan Tassini at Working Life, who's a UAW member, he's been great at debunking a lot of the myths that have been put out about uh, uh, what workers make and what their benefits are. Uh, and he was not thrilled at the concessions that the UAW just took. And he said just today, uh, think about this, it took decades to build a basic living standard that, that turned crappy industrial jobs into jobs that provided some measure of security, and in just a few years it has unraveled. Uh, the danger here is a larger one than just the painful future facing UAW members. I'm clear that the concessions agreed to uh, is all about saving an industry that, A, was and is run by incompetent managers, and, B, is suffering from a much broader collapse of the global economy. Uh, even domestic auto sales in Italy are down 30%, so this isn't simply about an American-based auto industry. And this is not about conceding to the idea that auto workers live some gold player lifestyle. If we don't make that clear, then the path to Walmart jobs is pretty obvious. Every company will now use the rep. Well, even auto workers are agreeing to cut their wages and benefits, and we can't let them do that. Uh, I also know briefly a uh, balloon juice. John Cole uh, had, a, had, a, had a good post about um, the new look of, of union busting, uh, referring to Mitt Romney's recent op-ed. When Mitt Romney says a new direction for unions, new direction means planned obsolescence. It's important to remember what Mitt Romney does to make his money. And when he gives advice to what should happen to the auto industry, you need to understand that his vision for America is more of the same in his world, if you ever working for eight dollars an hour at Walmart, getting their health care for Medicare, and Medicaid, and barely making it, um, so uh, there's been a decent push, I think, in the liberal blogosphere to get some uh, facts out about what the actual salaries and benefit packages are. Um, I don't think it has succeeded in uh, overly influencing the mainstream media because you still you see a number of posts, you know, Media Matters, uh, Art Levine, Huffington Post and others talking about how the $70 an hour line, which was debunked by a number of folks, including Felix Salmon at Portfolio Magazine, uh, still gets repeated. Uh, but there has been some interesting blogging uh, nevertheless. Yeah, well, I guess I'd say, you know, I, I do think that $70 an hour line is accurate because, you know, the, those are all those costs are part of the uh, labor contract, which is, which is the reality that the, the big three have to, have to work with. Um, well, you, it's, it's not accurate to lump in retiree costs to hourly salary, number one. Uh, and number two, you know, uh, a lot of talk about uh, pensions. There was a Wall Street Journal article two years ago that both Tassini and David Sorota blogged about at the time that the workers' pensions uh, were set aside in a fund that was making money and offsetting the costs, whereas the executive pensions, the CEO pensions, were not in such a fund, and were and those are the pensions that were directly dragging down the bottom line. And in that 2006 story, when GM said, "Well, you know, these pension costs they add 800 dollars to every car," and the Wall Street Journal said, "Well, are those your pensions or are the workers' pensions?" GM would an answer because they were keeping secret what, how, what the the proportion of their own pensions were. So again, there's a lot of a lot of misinformation about that, and uh, I'm sure Heritage has absolutely nothing uh, to do with any of that. Oh no, we we have we have, we we put out one of those uh, seventy dollar numbers, um, and and we we stand a hundred percent by it. We'll uh, we'll link, we'll link to our study and uh, we'll, we'll link away and, and we'll our graphic, off. and and people can decide for themselves how how, how accurate it is. Um, do you, do you think the uh, the auto bailout will be will be passed by this Congress or or the next one? I, honestly, I don't. I mean, clearly the. I mean, I, I, I think it's uh, important we do something and do it, do it as well as possible. It's obviously it's a, it's a hard sell when, you know, their, their management has been terrible. So do you think it's going to be folded into that massive stimulus bill we've been talking about in January? It's, it's, it's very hard to game out, and there's obviously a concern that these companies won't make it until January 20th for that bill to be signed. I mean, that's, sort of, that, that's, that's where people are on sort of pins and needles right well, now. Well, GM's the only one who says they're not going to make it till January 20th, and most people think. But that potentially drags down the rest of them. Even though Ford's in better shape on paper. yeah, Ford, Ford and Chrysler said they're fine. GM's the only one that's saying that 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 they will die by January twentieth or before before. Because there's January a reason 20th. why they're doing this in concert. You know, there's a reason why Ford isn't saying screw off, GM, we're fine because they realize they they have a lot of intermingled uh, you know assets, things like suppliers and the like, uh, where if one company goes down, it drags down the whole bunch. So uh, we'll see. Uh, it, 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 it's not pulling well. Uh, the managers did a terrible job in their first uh, hearing. Uh, they were tonally off. They're trying to make amends. Um, 
but and I think what you've heard from Congress people is, you know, we need Bush and Obama on the phones, uh, which is such as we, we need someone above us to twist our arms and tell us that this is really do or die. Uh, and I don't know, I can't predict if they're going to do that now. I mean, obviously Bush is far less inclined to do it than, than Obama is. Well, I got a question for you. But first, you know, yeah. let me just report that the uh, opinion on the conservative bloggers here is, is uh, uh, pretty much unanimous, 100 percent against the bailout. Sure. Um, Jim Manzi at the, at the corner, uh, who uh, has a consultant background, uh, look. Isn't he one of those guys that kept saying that we're not in recession? Uh, I don't know. Um, anyways, um, he took a look at the uh, GM uh, restructuring plan, and uh, this is what he wrote: uh, "I've been working my way through GM's much heralded restructuring plan that is being submitted to Congress tomorrow. It is a lot less work than I thought it might be." It makes at least one point very effectively. GM has an incredible short-term cash problem. While I am skeptical of bankruptcy in the next 27 days, which GM claims will happen without a $4 billion government cash infusion by the end of the month, it is surely true that at, that at current course and speed, this company is going to run out of money within a few months. And even worse, if we look out over the next six to nine months, it's very discouraging, even if they get the bailout. Uh, however, even if GM got the loans, and if we had a, a decent customer auto purchase for the next year or two, and if GM is able to improve its operations sufficiently, then they could squeak by. The point of the stock was supposed to be the presentation of the plan to achieve these operational improvements. But there's no there there. I guess somebody who's never read a real business plan might mistake this document for one. But it's a joke. It's basically, basically a list of assertions of amazing improvements, entirely uh, discontinuous with actual performance to date, that they will achieve. What's missing is any real indication of how they will go about accomplishing this. Now, the most obvious response to all this is to say that I'm the fish at this table because this is not a real business plan, but simply a political document. It exists to provide political cover to members of Congress. Um, but if that's the case, it's unintentionally beautiful illustration of why industrial policy fails. It's both economically crucial and very hard to allocate capital well. That's why people who are good at it make so much money. Business struggle to do well, to do this well, and they're and they're all really trying. What do you think the odds? are that this is a wise use of money when the people involved are barely pretending to try. Uh, so I guess I guess my, my question after that is, um, you know, this money is going to be wrapped into whatever economic stimulus it has, and we just got through saying that the stimulus is only going to work if it's spent wisely. So I guess my question is, you know, with, with all the problems the left has with the way GMs have run in the past, uh, do you think this is a wise investment that the taxpayer should be making? I mean, I think that's that's a very difficult call. Uh, and it's not, I, I'm sure I'm sure that in let me let me let me put it to you more frankly. Then um, we our first part of this conversation was saying that the Democratic brand is going to rise or fall on how well uh, the Democrats repair the economy. And, well, and, I, and I so I guess my question is, knowing that, do you think the auto bailout is a good or bad bet for the Democrats? I think that's a very hard question to answer. I think it has to be structured the right way. I mean, I'm 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 more inclined well, no one's, to say. Well, no one's that, arguing that should be structured the wrong okay, let, way. Let, let, let me let me answer the question here. <laughs> I'm trying to give you the best answer I can. Um, uh, I'm inclined to say that it's a it's a you know a, a question of you know what are what are your better of, of bad options. Uh, so I can't be as sure that's going to work out fantastically, but I'm quite sure that if you let it just you know completely go kaput. And you add, you know, a million new lost jobs uh, into your recession. Uh, that strikes me as obviously disastrous. So then it's a question of how do you structure this in the best possible way, so that it does work and it can be something that doesn't uh, lose taxpayers' money, but allows companies to recover and pay the money back over time. Uh, so it's I, I can't easily answer that knowing what all, all the details are and seeing how it's executed. Uh, Jim Manzi, who I pretty sure I don't have any respect for if, I, if I'm thinking of the right person uh, as far as economic uh, insight. Uh, but I did see on CNN uh, Mark Zandel, who was with commie.com, uh, who was also testifying today at Congress. He was saying, look, I don't think this is $34 billion. I think it's going to be a bigger number than that. So don't, don't kid yourself. But I do think these plans allow for long-term viability if you stay on top of them and they stick to the script. Well, you know, so you, you there's were someone before, out there, an independent observer, saying that this can be done well. So I think it's possible. Uh, and I'm sure that if it was up to, you know, Obama's, you know, choice, this would not be the first 
package out of the box because you're cleaning up a giant, giant mess and not doing more bold and exciting things like high-speed rail. Well, you were, you were asking before what the, uh, the GOP critique uh, is going to be in the coming years and, and how this libertarian populism is going to play out. And this is how, is that Democrats uh, are going to have the government uh, running large sections of the economy, like the auto industry, and they're going to keep failing and keep not succeeding and keep coming back to the Capitol Hill for more and more money and more and more bailouts. And all the time, the Republicans are going to be saying, look at those jokers. It's corporate welfare. We need to get the government out of all this. We need to stop the bailouts. We need to stop all this spending and, you know, let America be America again and, and, and let the market work. And, uh, you know, you know we're, we're, we're going to find out, Democrats are going to bet that uh, – all their all their government infrastructure spending is going to come on on time under budget and uh, free of government corruption and GM's going to turn around for the you know first time in the last 30 years and all of a sudden magically become profitable and the Republicans are going to take the opposite bet and we'll we'll see how that plays out. We will see. Uh, well, let's say if if they do bail out the auto industry and the oh, they do will. turn they'll, around, they'll, they'll get their money. What's that? They'll get their money. Obama will give them the money. Wait, but if 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 it's done and it is done well, I mean, this I think is a uh, you know I I am more inherently confident that you can do public investment into green technology, high speed rail. Um, you well, know, one would hope so. If, if you weren't, you'd be a Republican, right? Uh, <laughs> they're taking a uh, calamitous auto company uh, that's been running to the ground over decades, and ha- and having to to retool it to. Uh, meet the needs of the 21st century. You know that is, that's a much harder job, and that's not what anyone uh, would like to do. It's it's cleaning up a giant mess. But you know you 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 get involved in politics to govern and deal with messes, and so that's what the, that's the job they've taken on, and that's why I imagine they will likely do it, even though the polling of it is, uh, on it is terrible, um, because they believe that they don't do it. The ramifications will be much worse. Well, good luck running GM. <laughs> You know, there's some, there, uh, there was a uh, proposal out there by Dan Neal of the LA Times to temporarily nationalize GM. Uh, that'd be a lot cheaper to buy the stock where it's at now. You could do that for $3 billion as opposed to $34. Uh, and this was done with, with uh, Conrail uh, in the 70s and 80s. It was temporarily nationalized. They, got it, they, they, they fixed it up, and then they sold it off once the job was done. Um, so it's it's a decent argument. I haven't seen that argument get made in any seriousness on Capitol Hill. Uh, but when we're dealing with you know choice between bad options, I wonder if if there's a stalemate there of an argument like that might end up getting more currency. Uh, it might, uh, but not from our side. <laughs> um, so before we close out here, uh, I know uh, Matt and Ross already touched on this uh, last week and. Uh, uh, Chris Hayes and uh, Matthew Connetti already touched on it uh, on, on Monday. Um, but uh, what do you think of the uh, the Obama appointment so far? Which which are your favorites? Which are your least favorites? <laughs> well, I, per- I personally have taken the tack that's more about policy than personnel. Um, you know, not every personnel choice would be my choice, but all the policy that Obama's talked about so far, whether it's um, an economic recovery plan. Whether it's being uh, following through and having a real cap and trade, a global warming plan, uh, closing down Gitmo, uh, and the like, you know, there's been no uh, serious uh, walking back of any policy proposal uh, from Obama in this transition period. So if he's going to have people who are less liberal than me execute these uh, liberal progressive ideas, you know, that's fine with me. Not everyone has that attitude. Um, I think there's a, there's a range of opinions in the blogosphere about it. I saw differing views from uh, Chris Hayes at The Nation um, versus Spencer Ackerman at, at Fire Dog Lake. You know, Chris Hayes was, was lamenting that there weren't enough progressive movement members being picked. Uh, Ackerman was saying, hey, having uh, uh, keeping Bob Gates as Secretary of Defense was a masterstroke because now you are giving the uh, wind down of the Iraq war a Republican sheen, and it was going to help him maintain good relationship with the rest yes, of the my, Pentagon. Yes, my, my lost blogging heads with Ari, we, we, we touched on that post and, mm. and how I almost had a heart attack when I read it. Cause I, I, well, actually, that's not true. I, I, what I said was, you know, if, if, if I had read that post six months ago, I would probably killed over the heart attack. <laughs> but, um, you know, General uh, Ray Ord- Ordinero and uh, Petraeus have both spoken at Heritage, and uh, General Petraeus' speech in particular 
um, when we posted the video. Um, it was the most incoming lefty traffic from like TPM, uh, you know, uh, Fire Dog Lake, Spencer Rackman that we've gotten a long time. And this was still during the election. Um, right. And so they were all uh, picking out uh, the, the Petraeus part where he was talking about, uh, you know, working with um, uh, elements that we did not work with before in Iraq and that, and that the, the, their line was that, you know, this endorsed the, the Obama talk to, the, talk to your enemies approach to foreign policy. Um, but it was all positive. Um, so after that incident, I was like, oh, you know, I definitely see how, you know, the Obama and the left is going to become very comfortable with a very flexible uh, troop withdrawal timeline in Iraq and, and how Gates fits into that. Well, keep in mind, you know, you know, there are a number of us uh, who complained during the primary that Obama and Clinton Edwards were not taking the, the Bill Richardson position right. of complete withdrawal. Bowers, Bowers, no loudest of all. Right. And um, that argument did not carry the day in the Democratic primary, did not carry the day in you know, even the most liberal primary states. So that argument – so it's weird, this notion – I saw there's a time story today that, you know, Obama is walking away from this end of the war – Position, that's going to uh, infuriate liberal supporters. And you know, this argument was had, and Obama won it by, on the argument that there should be residual forces. So I don't think anyone's going to be all that, all that shocked. Um, yes and no. <laughs> Not everybody pays as close attention as you, me, and Chris Bowers. I think, I think there are a number of people who will be uh, somewhat surprised um, at, at the uh, direction and tone that, that Obama has. People will be surprised if, at the end of four years, there is a lot of uh, a lot of bloodshed going on because there's a ge- there's a generic promise that I will end this war. Well, there's there's, uh, there's for the past two months, two three months, there's been no bloodshed. So if if there's a significant increase of bloodshed in Iraq, it's at this point it's no longer not going to be good well, for George it's, Bush. It's going to be bad for you Obama. Still, you still can't quite just take a leisurely stroll down the street in Iraq. There there there's still violence there. Um, but if, 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 things, uh, if things stay the same or get worse, um, then obviously that, it's, it's that fundamental premise, I will end this war, that uh, Obama is going to be held accountable on. If there is still a residual force there in a, in a peaceful setting, I mean, Obama's talking about taking out combat forces in 16 months. He never said he would take out all forces. Um, so if you have non-combat forces still there in uh, 2012 and things are still going along in a smooth way, there's not going to be any kind of disgruntlement on the left because most of the left accepted that in the first place, even though some elements of the left did not. Yeah, I guess my takeaway, and then we're getting too much in the weeds in Iraq, I wanted to keep it on point. My, my, my takeaway would be, be um, I think you don't realize the extent to which Obama now owns Iraq um, and that uh, if he hopes to survive at all, it better stay the same or get better. If it gets worse... Um, I don't think it will, but if it gets if it get worse, that will be very bad for him. I I'm in complete agreement okay. with that point. Um, but it's very very rare. I get to 100 percent agree with the Glenn Greenwald post, so uh, I wanted to read it. Um, okay. And this is this is back from uh, November 23rd. But uh, Glenn writes, I've been genuinely mystified by the disappointment and surprise being expressed by many liberals over the fact that Obama's most significant appointments thus far are composed of pure Beltway establishment figures drawn from the center right of the Democratic Party. Proper party and probably once he names Defense Secretary and CIA Director, even from the Bush administration, but not from the left. None of them are liberals. But then Obama said repeatedly that he was not ideological, that he cared about, quote, what works. I don't know why people didn't believe that. He's a technocrat who wants to, quote, solve problems and, quote, change politics. The first may actually end up producing the kind of ideological shift liberals desire simply because of the dire set of circumstances greeting the new administration. The second was always an empty fantasy. Politics is just another word for human nature, and that hasn't changed since we were dancing around the fire outside our caves. Uh, at that point, I said, yeah, ha, you go, Glenn. Um, well, you know, over the, over the course of the past year, we, we had this argument in the past, I, I repeatedly kept trying to convey to you <laughs> that a lot of liberal bloggers, not everybody, but a lot of the more notable liberal bloggers were, were never on the Obama bandwagon. Um, even though uh, Coase was, not, not Coase the person, but Coase the community, was pretty strongly for Obama uh, relatively early, and a lot of people looked at that as saying Obama has the net roots, uh, it was always evident that a number of bloggers were always, always kept Obama at an arm's length, never liked the bipartisan rhetoric that he, that he based a lot of his campaign on. Um, and so it's folks like, like Greenwald and like Jane Hampshire at Fire Dog Lake 
and some others who are are saying, "I told you so." Now, and not not that they're not that they're surprised at all, um, but you know, these are. Um, well, I, th- I think you made a good distinction there because I think um, you're right. I mean, when I you know worked for National Journal, I covered this, and I I wrote many spotlights articles on how oh there definitely was a lot of consternation over Obama's true positions and and the the tone he was taking, um, you know, particularly the the, bi- the bipartisan part of it. Um, in the in the leadership, uh, not all, but a lot of the leading members of the progressive movement. But you know, I think you're right to make a distinction in that the the coast community, and I think the larger progressive blogosphere, the leadership definitely bought hook line, hook, line, and seeker. This you know change we believe in Obama's you know the dawning of a new age. He's going to lower the sea levels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know rhetoric and and story. And uh, I I do think those people are in for surprise and disappointment. Well, I, I, I don't. I don't think that's. I mean, there's definitely, and you're seeing a little bit of this in the blogosphere now, where some bloggers who have been skeptical of Obama are being critical of other bloggers who are being more diehard Obama. Um, uh, both Greenwald made that point. Uh, Sirota, who's put up some critical posts about Obama, um, uh, has been trying to stress, "Hey, we can't have a, uh, a strong progressive uh, movement community if we can't if we can't dissent about anything. You know, so don't don't beat me up." If I'm right, if I right. Be something critical, um, but there, there is this. You know, liberals had a tendency to oversimplify the right, to, to treat the right are a bunch of sheep. They're all top down. They do whatever Karl Rove and their masters tell them to do. When it's it's a more diverse movement that we gave it credit for, and the the left is the same way. There's diversity of view. There's some people who like the fact. <laughs> there are liberals who like the fact that Obama made these picks. They like the pragmatic element to it. You have in the most recent Gallup poll 94% approval from Democrats about how Obama's handling his transition. That obviously is going to include a lot of self-described liberals. Um, so it's not that people are going to be surprised. It's that the range of view within the left is more uh, is more diverse than people on the outside give it credit for. All true. Uh, I think the ultimate takeaway from this this uh, this week in blog is that it's uh, all going to come on. It's all going to turn on uh, how it all how the economy turns out and how the uh, what the Obama administration actually does and what his policies do, not so much the personnel. It tends to be that. Okay. Good place to end it, Bill. Good to talk to you. Talk to you next week.